Books out, please. We got a lot to do. We're going to do one topic today. Maybe two if we get through it soon enough. Okay, we're on page um, five of our books. Phones away, please. Computers only up to blank pages. Today's class is all about Shabbat. Very good, Shani. Very funny. Very good. He's always a comedian. Today's class is all about chicken heads. Chicken heads. We're in the world of Davar She'enu Misgavein. That's an inevitable, unintentional malacha. Now we're going to talk about something called... Shh. Who has the phone on ring anymore? Who didn't do that anymore? I rarely hear that sound. Um, today's discussion is called Pasik Resha. Pasik Resha is the discussion. And... We kind of put it under the banner of Dovashen and Miskavain. <coughs> this is actually the most chamor, the most stringent of all the malachet machshevets that's out there. First of all, what does the word Pesik Reisha even mean? What does it refer to? Pesik Reisha. Okay, so Pesik Reisha literally means the head of a chicken. That has been cut off. Pesik, cut, raise of the head. What does that refer to? So it refers to the story in the Gemara of a young boy who wanted, now it's going to sound unusual to you, but remember this was pre-iPhone, iPad, all the rest of it. Can you, do you mind closing the door, please? I just like this buzz of noise outside. Thank you. It refers to a young man. Come through, it's okay. It refers to a young boy before the world of entertainment that we know it, who wanted to play with the head of a chicken. That's what they used to do, I guess. Don't ask me. And so he says to his Abba on Shabbat, Dad, could you cut off the head of that chicken so I can play with it? A live chicken. I, I, I add over that. The ethics and morals of doing such a thing is not the discussion. Let's just look at the halachic story itself. And the father said, I can't do that. It's Shabbat. What's the malacha? Shochet. That's right. You cannot take the life of a living animal on Shabbat. He's like, but I don't care about the dead chicken. I don't want the dead chicken. I want the head. And his father said to him, what was it's impossible to remove the head of a chicken without killing that chicken. Okay, maybe it's possible chicken, they move around a little bit afterwards. But generally speaking, take the head of a chicken, chicken is dead. Pasik ratio. Is it possible to cut off the head of a chicken without killing it? Answer is no. Even though that's not what you want. It's an inevitable and absolute consequence. So that's really what the idea is over here with Psyche Ratio. It's doing an action which has a secondary motivation, yet the malacha is absolutely inevitable, it's going to happen. You cannot do it, although you're not directly doing that thing itself. It's an inevitable occurrence by direct result. Okay, that's the best translation we can find it. Inevitable <coughs> occurrence with a definite result. Let us have a look at some examples of this. One we looked at already, so you're familiar with it. And that's the example of our garden party. I have my heavy table. I have my soft soil. I want to drag heavy table over soft soil. Am I allowed to do it? No, no it's a psyche ratio. But I don't want to plow the soil. It's going to happen. It's a direct result of the initial action. It's inevitable. It's a psyche ratio. And therefore it is forbidden. Therefore it is a forbidden action. Even though, according to Melechus Machsheves, if you remember from last class, it's not. 
because Melechus Meshavah was a direct action. Remember that? Melechus Meshavah is the way it was done. It was done in a direct, very clear, absolute way. Remember that? That's not happening over here. I'm doing something, which is actually going to lead to something else. But that something else is definitely going to happen. This is probably one of the most severe transgressions. It is not permitted, even though it's not a Melechet Mach Shevet. Let's have a look at another example of this. So number one, heavy chair or soft soil. Two, um, eating in the garden with your family. We're going to say your garden for now because we're going to change the location a little bit later. But let's go slowly, step by step. And you want to wash your hands okay, for the meal. So you get a cup and you go over to the grass and you end up washing your hands over the lawn or over plants. Now, the initial act of pouring water over your hands, is that a malacha? Is that not a malacha? Not a malacha. Not a malacha. You can wash your hands. However, the inevitable consequence, the psik resha, I use the expression because when you talk halacha, Shabbos, even outside this class, right, they talk in this term. The psik resha of it is the water is going to hit the ground. It's going to hit the earth. This is your earth. You're going to benefit from it. This is your garden. These are your plants. And therefore, we are going to forbid it. It's inevitable. Water is going to go. It's going to go over your hands. It's going to land on the ground itself. Over there, it's inevitable and it is forbidden. Combing your hair on Shabbat, right? You got thick, knotty hair, and you want to comb it and say, "Brush it." I said, "Comb it." Is aligning your hair forbidden on Shabbat? No. You can take your hands and do it this way and do a light fixing, and that's okay. But when you comb your hair, it's an inevitable consequence and a positive one that hairs are going to rip out of your head, and that. Point to many people as gozes, and therefore it is forbidden. Are we all clear so far? Is this good? So remember, we're in the world of Melechus Machsheves. We said Melechus Machsheves was the way it was done in the Mishkan. We're like, one second, I've got a problem over here. Because you told me that if it wasn't done this way in the Mishkan, or didn't have the same results, it's okay. I've got a second reaction over here. That's not the way it was done in the Mishkan. I know. Even so, it's forbidden. We're going to find exceptions, but that's the rule. There's always exceptions to every rule, but that's the rule. Okay. Turning on a light switch on Shabbat. Yay or nay? You sure about that? Yeah, that's right. We don't do it. What am I actually doing when it's on the light switch? Um, Look up the switch, and then there is a flow of electricity, and it comes together so beautifully, and light turns on. Interestingly enough, there's actually different opinions what the actual malacha is. Some say it's mavir, it's kind of lighting, you're making fire in the filament or heating it up. Uh, the Chazanish very famously said, actually, that it's not that at all, right? It's not real fire, it's actually bone air building because you're closing the circuit. Is that in physics, are they closing the circuit? Yes, it's a form of building. I mean, it's an academic discussion because according to both opinions, it's forbidden. But when I looked at that switch, I'm not actually doing anything. I'm just moving a piece of plastic. I'm not starting a fire. That's not the way things were done in the Michigan. The Michigan, they made a fire, they made a fire! Right, they took heat and... What's the big deal with this? And what's the answer? It's inevitable. If I turn on that switch, immediately the light's gonna come on. Inevitable, direct result on my action. Even though it's not the way it was done in the Melech and Machshevet, even so, it is forbidden. Using your phone, what's not, what that? That's an interesting question. Using your phone. It could well be that it's uh, the Rabbanan. To be honest with you, but I'll tell you when I said that. Uh, that means it may not be an original one of the Lamatet Malachot, okay? But taking energy and using the energy, it could fall under this Mavir. It could well be. Mavir. Somehow. Yeah. Okay. So this one is um, very, very strict. Okay, how about this? So that's the simple one. Yeah. Yes. Lit candles yes, 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 yes. Probably. They're totally forbidden, forbidden, by the way. I mean, a whole Torah is made up of rabbinic laws. It's totally forbidden to do that. Okay. Um, actually, it could be even more than that. Because when you move it around, okay, you could be increasing or lowering the flame as you go as well. So that would be increasing. So that would be a problem of Mavra as well. You just draw a parallel with the phone. Like when you, you move your 
And look, I'll tell you why, the phone is slightly different because there's no real fire happening in there. That's why it's not so clear. It's still forbidden, but it's not so clear that it's on the same level as a real fire. We make the same between real fires and non-real fires, okay? So electrics may fall into that, yeah. By turning on the switch, the light comes on. All we try to figure out was, well, what is the malacha actually happening over here? I'm not doing anything. It's a, an immediate direct result, but I'm not actually doing it. I'm not making a fire on the thing itself. It's happening through, but since it's inevitable, that's what we're trying to figure out, the malacha. One of them says it's mahavir, it's making fire. The other one says, no, it's, it's, uh, it's bona. But it's a perceived ratio. But it's definitely a perceived ratio. I mean, it's inevitable it's going to happen. Clear? Yes. What about dimming? Um, that's very, very interesting discussion, by the way, is dimming the light itself. On Shabbos, we don't do it, for sure. Um, by the way, it's not so clear exactly why in many of these cases, but you're increasing or decreasing the amount of energy going in to the light itself. There's no doubt about it. On Yom Tov, um, there are those that used to do it. Yeah, you go you back, do you go back, and some people, there is I'm such sure. a, you hear a little bit when it comes because you can, you know, increase or start a fire. So by Yom Tov, we're going to, when we get to that malacha itself, we'll see the, those. Uh, we don't do it, by the way. But you can actually increase it and do it right. But on Shabbos, we don't do it because you're adding the energy, taking away the energy, increasing, right, fire, right, is also a problem as well. What's the difference between secretion and between, like, forbidding on Shabbat? Okay. I'm not sure of your question, so I'm going to describe it again to you. It's a difficult concept, I get it. Melechad Machshevet means the way it was done in the Mishkan. That you definitely can't do. So we said, one second, but let's say we will find exceptions to that. For example, we said we're going to look at it, doing something with a shinui, an unusual way. Usually, I write with my right hand. If I write with my left hand, it's a shinui, it's no longer a Melechad Machshevet. This is just another example. A Pasik Reisha is another example of an exception to Melechet Machshevet. Why? Because the way things were done were direct. I make a fire now. I'm making the fire for that purpose, and it's a direct result. I said, well, one second. By me dragging the table or cutting the head off the chicken, I'm not doing it to get shita, to get the animal dead. He's like, well, one second, you cut a head off, even though you just want the head to play with, it's going to happen. Chicken dies. So therefore, it's totally forbidden. Psigresha, definitely not allowed. Okay? So it's an exception to the rule, but we still make it forbidden. However, follow carefully. You're going to need me now for this class. Let's say we were to find and add another aspect to this, which moves it further away from the Melechad Machshavet. Okay? So bear with me. It gets interesting, but it gets tricky as well. Let's say I don't have an absolute inevitable, but I get close. And let's call that Karav Lipsik Ratio. What does Karav Lipsik Ratio mean? It's close. It's not Absolute, but it's close. I'm getting probable consequence. Psi gratia is inevitable. Now let's call it probable. It's probable. Can you think of an example that is probable? Probable, rather. So let's say I have a candle in my house, and I put my candle on Shabbat. You know, where do the candles go on Shabbat? Where do we put them? Near the table. Near the table where you eat. That's the lucky, right? You shove the candles near where you eat. You actually benefit from some of the light near where you eat. Happens to be where I eat as well, I have a window. And it's a windy day. It's a windy day, but it's hot inside. I want to open the window. You with me? So there I am at my table. There's my candle. There's the window. I'm not going to open the window. Is the wind going to blow out the candle? You know what? Probably. Do I know 100%? No. I don't know 100%. It's close to it, but it's not absolutely certain. Many people consider it the same, 
and I used to go to a Rav on Shabbat, and he, we would sit there schwitzing. He wasn't rich enough to have air conditioning put into his apartment. Imagine that. I'm talking 20 years ago, still, that's like, you know. And he would sit on Shabbat, and I'm like, Rabbi, get open the window. He's like, I can't. He's going to blow up the candles. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, probably. That was the end of it. Sadiq. <laughs> Big Sadiq. I used to give him money, by the way. Um, I don't know if he ever bought it. Probably spent it on Sfarim. But that's the way he was. Okay? In such a situation, we're close to it. Probably going to. It's prohibited, although I'm not 100%, but I'm very, very close to it. So I moved away a little bit, but even that's not enough. Are you following? Okay, so we start off Mechabah Shabbat. Then we did Pesigresha, definitely. That's totally Asur, even though it's not the way it was done. I'm like, you know what? I'm not absolutely 100, but I'm holding, and you have to judge it, holding by close possible. In that situation, probable, since Pesigresha is so strict, I still don't do it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Slight chance is different to a much higher chance. We're going to start moving down. So we're starting at the top. We're starting 100%. Follow carefully. We're starting here by 100% over here. We're like, no. Now we move down a little bit. Okay, put it by 90% chance, if it's possible. We're like, no. Now we're going to move him further down. The lower you get, suddenly you enter realms of actually you can. I mean, sometimes, you know what? Sometimes it's subjective. You're absolutely right. I can't lie to you. Sometimes it's objective. Objective, the rabbis spoke about it. So the rabbis didn't speak about every scenario that a person can get themselves into. You've got to learn these laws, as I said in the introduction to this program, this class, because if you don't, you're never going to figure it out. In other words, for many people, Hilcha Shabbat is yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And sometimes you've got to learn the mechanics. Once you have the mechanics, you can make an educated decision. It's like Sims. Our best customers are the educated ones. Oh, they, didn't they close down, Sims? Okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay. Let's do the next one. So we have, we have two so far. We have absolute psique ratio. Hold on. We have absolute psique ratio, and we have karabin psique ratio. Both forbidden. Let me ask you this. Follow my madness. Please. When the malacha... This is a question. When the malacha was done in the Mishkan... Once again, these early classes, the tough ones, this gets easier, I promise you. Once you get these systems into your head... You start to apply them. It's like, oh, that's a secret ratio. It's done. When the malach was done in the Mishkan, malach and Machshedah, the <coughs> way it was done, did the person doing the malacha benefit from it or not benefit from it? Did the person doing the malacha benefit from it or not benefit from it? What do you think? So, not such a trick question. Out of 45 people, give me one person here. They benefited from it, yes. He took a stab in the dark, well done. Yes, his cousins. They benefited from it, okay? Whether they were killing an animal, they're going to benefit from the animal. Whether they were um, building something, they were benefiting from the building. When they drew letters on the boards, right, and they were writing, they were benefiting from it. There was always a benefit that came from the action. Benefit being personal benefit, benefit to the community, it's good. I'm getting personal benefit out of it. When a malacha is done in the world of melechet machshevet, there's a benefit that has to come out of it, and that benefit has to be felt, has to be palpable. Okay? That chicken that was killed, I still have a nice chicken to use now. Right? I'm going to benefit from that. Okay, I'm going to use the head right now, but I'm also going to benefit from the chicken as well. When I turn that light on, that's a I'm going to benefit from it. Right? It's happening, I'm going to benefit from it. Is there a scenario you can think of where a person does the act and actually they don't benefit from it? Now that's a trickier question. And I wouldn't have figured this one either. But actually there could well be. And we're going to give it a title. I'm going to call it the Pesik Ratio, Dolo Nichale. Let me explain what those words mean. Write it down and we're going to understand it. Psik Reisha, the low Nichale, as it's referred to, means an inevitable action that actually I'm not benefiting from. There's no personal benefit. There's no personal benefit 
by me doing this actual malacha. Let me give you a clear example. And actually, once you take out the personal benefits, because remember, malacha mechshevet, you were getting personal benefit out of doing the action. But if I can remove the personal benefit, which I'm going to try to do, suddenly, the psig ratio is not so good. Because it's not a direct action, it's still a psig ratio. But I'm going to throw in no personal benefit. When I'm starved, when I stick those two together, it's likely that I'm able to do it. Not always, but possibly. Um, let's go back to watering the garden. We said that you can't wash your hands over a piece of grass. Why not? Watering grass is... You've got to know this. You've got to know this. We did it already. Come on. Look in your books. You have to. What? It is no Horish is plowing. Oh, probably close to plowing. Zorea, seeding, Zorea. Okay? We said it's a tolder, I think, of Zorea. Now, what's the problem? If I water grass, I benefit from the grass. I get personal benefits. Even though I don't care, water them. But you know, in the end, it's my grass, water falls, and it's good for me. It may be a very small good, but it's still a good. True? Let's say, however, I'm not washing my hands over my grass. I'm washing my hands over your grass or some public grass where, to be honest with you, I get a personal benefit. Your grass grows. It's good for you. It ain't good for me. Lush lawns are good for the owners, not for everyone else. We don't really care. Loch Buckley. It doesn't bother me. Suddenly it changes completely. It could well be that doing that is permissible. We are careful not to do it because it's kind of very, very direct. But let me give you an example that we do do, or many people do, I should say. Some people are strict in all these areas. I'm going to give you the halacha. How you decide to apply it is up to you. Some people, when it comes to the Hilcha Shabbat, are extremely from, right, and stay away from things. But I'm going to get to the essence of the law, not what people do, but what the halacha opinions say. Um, garden parties. Some people will not have a garden party in their own garden and bring out drinks, because they can spill the drinks, the drink's going to hit the ground, and end up, the earth starts growing from that act. They get benefit from it. You with me? But they'll do it in shul. And the shul property, some will say, is fine. Because even though it's a perceived ratio that water's going to spill, right? I think it's absolutely inevitable, but it's very probable. But it's a de no lichale. It's not absolutely certain someone's going to spill drinks. I mean, there's always some water spilled. You know, it's a de no lichale. And they'll be like, you know what? There's a difference between water spilling on my grass and someone else's grass. That's a perceived ratio. De lo lichale. You following? I have removed the personal benefit, psig ratio. It's well, well likely that I would be allowed to do it. I have a clarification question. Yeah. When you said at the beginning, I mean all of them, so if it's not in Malachi Malchavet, you said it's still forbidden. So, wait, 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 wait. We're now we're getting so fun. We lasered in. We're like, yeah. Malachi Malchavet. That's the way it was done. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But I can remove the Malachim al Shevet by a secondary consequence. Heads off chickens, pouring water on my hands, ends up hitting the lawn, and all the other examples we're going to look at. Now we're like, but you know what? Not all psigratias are created equally. Some are very, very strict. Don't do it. Some are close. Mm, we don't do it. Psigratias are lichale. You know what? From that circumstance, in many cases and situations, is permitted. Because this has taken me further away from the original Melech Machshevet, which was done directly for my benefit. That's what I did over here. So what's with the switching hands? Is that forbidden or not? So that's gonna be Shinoi, leave that aside. We're gonna to come to that. Shinoi, switching hands, we're gonna see. It's gonna be forbidden, but in case I need to do a Melacha, I can use that. So it's but it's definitely not a Torah law. You definitely have not done Melacha the Reister over there. Psi ratio I probably have. But once you start to move, basically you're moving away. Melech and Machshev is on top. Melech and Machshev on top. And the further I get away from it, the more chance I can do it. That's how Halacha Shabbat, by the, the Hilchot Shabbat are unique in this area. Where you start to finagle and get further, further away. The further away from that primordial Melech and the Mishkan, the more chance you can do it. What's the opposite of Psyk Reisha Delo Michale? What would you think? Psyk Reisha. Uh, which is it's psig ratio I'm getting benefit from it over there I'm getting benefit from it's psig ratio best not to do it 
Okay? Best not to do it. Are you all following so far? Are we good? If you're not, please ask me. Do not be shy. This is new stuff for all of you. It's not easy. It's a whole new way of thinking about Shabbat, yeah. Is, um, is the last one the same as Seek Reisha? You know, um, yeah, pretty much. We just, it's just within Seek Reisha, there's this category. Seek Reisha is inevitable, I'm going to benefit from it. Yeah, pretty much. So that's, that's how we, the one we focus on is the, the long Yichale, because it's removed me from this. It's removed me from the main thing. What's the difference between Seek Reisha and Seek Reisha? There's probably no difference. Just Seek Reisha, the long Yichale is moving yeah. away. That's more, more, there'll be cases which are more permissible, as we're going to see. Cases where I'm not getting direct benefits. Most time you do stuff, you get benefit from it. Okay, let's do another one. Who's excited? Miserable lunch. Okay, how about, how about, I find a psychratia, which is, remember, an inevitable direct consequence. And I remove, not the personal benefit, but I remove the direct consequence one step away from direct to indirect. I'm going to take away the direct and make it indirect. It's inevitable, but it's not immediate. It's inevitable, but it's not immediate. Let's call this a Pasik Ratio al Gramma. So it's a Pasik Ratio, yeah? And we'll see there's many examples of this. Al Yedei Grama. Grama means secondary action. It's a secondary action. It's a secondary outcome, maybe, is a better transfer, uh, translation of that. It's caused indirectly. Let me give you some examples. This will clear it up. If you're confused. By the way, if you're not confused, you don't understand this, by the way. Being confused is a good sign when we learn Hilchah Shabbat, especially initially. Okay, it's a real secondary action. And by the way, we're going to learn this is important because when you're in this world, you could probably do it. So it's a psych ratio. Let me give you the classic example. Am I allowed to open up a fridge on Shabbat? Just to make it very clear for you. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, I can. What's a possible problem that comes with opening a fridge on Shabbat? Yes. The light can turn on. The light can turn on. That's right. The light can turn on. Am I allowed? What would you call that? And all the things we discussed today is a psig ratio, psig ratio, coral psig ratio, psig ratio, only a chayvah, but today is a psig ratio of the grama. What do you think? The light turning on. Where would you put it? What's your name? Aura. Aura. Perfect. The light turning on. And Aura's giving it to us. It doesn't get better than that. Yes. Shabbat, you get it? Like, I mean... Right. Yes, Aura. Probably, maybe Corona. You would call it, would you call that well, Corona Psyche Ratio? It's not always happening. When you open the it's fridge, correct. when you open the fridge, yeah. is the light going to turn on? Yeah. yeah. Are you sure about that? Yeah. yeah. Give me a percentage chance. 100%. Right. So it can't be Corona Psyche Ratio. Okay. It's going to have to be Psyche Ratio. Is it the no Nichalei or is it Nichalei? Nichalei. I'm going to benefit from it. I'm going to benefit from the light turning on. Well, actually, I'll just put this aside for a second. It kind of depends where the stuff is. If it's in the door, it may be slightly different to it being in the back of the fridge where the light's really needed. But let's just leave that aside because that's very specific. But just on the basis of it, turning on the opening of the fridge is forbidden because the light's going to turn on. Aura. Aura's come on. The lights are on. We're all in big trouble. We're not going to do it. Right. But well, you're putting sellotape, no? Okay, fine. So you're going to cover it with the light. We'll find a way to do it. My wife got a thing with the button, turn it off, put sellotape yeah, on it. Then end by ya, yeah, no problems. Oh. Okay. No problems. Just with the light coming on. Okay, that's one problem. We got over it. We know what the problem is. We got over it. Fantastic. We're going to tape it up, remove the light bulb. Everything's great. Give me another possible challenge, not related to the light, that may happen when I turn on, when I open the fridge. Yes. Warms it up so the, the fridge air turns on. Goes into the fridge, wow. The, the turns Michelle, on. you said something unbelievable over here. You're saying, one second. When I open the door, what happens? 
hot air goes in. When hot air goes into a fridge, what happens? The temperature goes up. The temperature goes up. What happens to a fridge when the temperature goes up? It starts working again. The machine cold. turns on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ladies, you should not be turning on your fridges, opening your fridges. Because every time you open your fridge, the hot air goes in, and the thing's going to kick in thermostat. You're making the thermostat turn on. What's the difference between that and hitting a light switch? Hello? It's indirect. It's grandma. You see, when you turn on the light switch, although it's a second reaction, it's immediate and it's inevitable. Here, it may be inevitable. I know for sure that thing's going to turn on, but I've had an extra layer of indirectness, which is, follow carefully, open the fridge door. That's what I did. Open the fridge door is not a problem. But then the hot air goes in. Hot air goes in, thermostat goes up, engine kicks in. Now other people are strict and don't open fridge doors. They put a device on the door to know when the engine's running, to know when to open and close it. There are such people. Are they obligated to do that? No, they're not. Why? I got a Pasique ratio. You could say it's a Corona Pasique ratio. You could say that, but we're going to consider those both the same. Are you sure things are going to go up to what degree? How long is the fridge open? I'm just sitting, I don't have to make a cheshbon. But either way, if I know it's going to happen, I open it up, then the air goes in, and that kicks up. We're good to go. You can open your fridge on Shabbos. That's the Pasique ratio. Are you following so far? We've done a lot today. We're going to do a little bit more. Let me give you another example that comes up. Hold your question one second, my darling. Put it in your cerebellum, and we'll get there in a minute. And it goes like this. It's Sukkot. And you build a sukkah on the grass. And you put a schlock on top. What's a schlock? Kisui, a cover, a plastic cover, which prevents the rain going in. You got the example so far? Now, it rained during the night. The ground is now dry. That's an important feature. Follow the story so far? We have ground, dry, um, grass, dirt, soil. Your grass, not the shul sucker, or your friend's sucker. Your grass, your sucker, on the grass. There's water on top of the schlock, and the earth is dry. Now I'm going to unroll the schlock. What's going to happen? The water is going to go and hit the grass. Am I allowed to unroll that schlock? Knowing full well the water is going to go and hit the grass. I can't. I'm going to benefit from it. Now had the ground been wet, that would have been okay. That would have been okay. Because I'm just adding to the wetness. It's already wet. I'm just adding to it. That's not a big deal. Right? So in many cases, there's water on top, the ground is usually dry or wet as well, okay? Or at least moist. So I have, let's illustrate this. People show me the Shabbat Halakha books many years later and still have a picture of this. So let's do artist time with Rabbi Hadjo. Who's excited? Okay, calm down. Okay, so one second. Here is my sukkah. It's on grass, okay? This is sukkah. This is grass. Here's my schlock on top. The schlock now fills up with water. I roll it off, water goes down, hits the grass, it's a problem. Somebody, based upon everything we described today, give me a solution to this problem, which people do actually use, including myself. I want to find a solution, because remember, Taking the schlock off, and the grass is dry, dry grass, taking the schlock off, water's gonna hit it, C ratio. That's a given, you can't do it. What can I do to allow me to do it? Okay, and we're gonna to try to use this in other situations as well. Ask your neighbor to do that. Ask your neighbor, if they're Jewish, that's a problem as well. If they're a non-Jew, that would actually help. We'll get to that in a second. Right, C ratio, Alade Goy, we're gonna to come to as well. That's gonna come very, very handy. When it comes to opening fridges and opening car doors, and other stuff as well. So leave it going out of for a second. Let's talk about yourself right now. Yeah. I just don't understand. If it rains and there's water on top of the sukkah, there's also water on the grass. Okay, so we've, we've created a scenario, just like any law book. We always create scenarios that work for the example. And for some reason, the water was up there for a couple of days, and the ground is now dry because it got really sunny after this. 
You, you give it to me? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. What can I do? From all these examples, what can I do? Give me, give me something over here. I said, actually, the question is a little unfair because I set you up to, to lose on this one. Where can I build a sukkah that would have helped? Uh, that's pretty much giving you the answer. Yes? On a patio, maybe. On a patio. Why is that going to help me? Because then, if, if you're pouring the water out on the floor, you're getting it on, not on the grass. It's getting it on the... But my patio is actually right next to the grass. Or it's a deck with slats in it, just like my sukkah, actually. So I build my sukkah on a deck. Okay, we have... Deck, 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 deck. Open, 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 open. And there's soil underneath it. Now it's grandma. You see, what's happened, I've actually removed one level over here. I've now removed one level. The water's going to fall off. Definite. It's going to hit the grass. Definite. It's going to hit the deck first. I've thrown in the grandma. It's inevitable. It's still a psigratia. But it's a psigratia not directly. Plus, I've thrown in the grandma as well, the second reaction. Bam! You're good to go. Or you can create it. Put yourself like a piece of wood next to it or a sheet next to your sucker on the grass. That's when you need to build it. The water comes off, hits the sheet. The sheet then rolls off the patio onto the grass. It's going to hit it. Not a problem. Even though it's your grass, even though it's inevitable, the grama has saved me. Why? Because when they did Malacha in the Mishkan, there was no grama. It was done now, for now, full-blown, bang. Here, second reaction. Save. I'm saved. Okay? It's not on the refrigerator again. So the refrigerator is okay wow. because I'm opening the door. That's my action. Opening door, not a problem. The light comes on immediately, that's a problem. That's a psigratia, vadai. Now I'm opening the door. Stage one, hot air goes in. Stage two, hot air triggers the motor. Stage three, motor turns on. You've added an extra grama, an extra secondary interposition between the original act and the outcome, that grandma makes all the difference. But what's the grandma in the... <clears throat> the grandma is the ground, is the is the sheet or the deck or something else. No, in the... Uh, the I don't understand it. The grandma... Does everyone get the refrigerator example? Yeah. Yeah, Miss Cousins, you got it? <laughs> Explain it to our friend Shani Hava. You can do a better job. Um, it's tricky. The fridge isn't turning on just from the turning on because the hot, the hot air is going in and then it senses the hot air and then it turns on. But it's because of you that air. Yeah, but it's indirect. It's not like you're turning on your... It's because of you, Nachon. That's why we're still in Psyche Ratio. If it wasn't because of me, it wouldn't be a problem. But now it's indirect. Much more indirect than turning on the light switch, which is immediate direct benefit now. That extra delay, that extra delay that comes in is far enough away from the original malacha where things were done immediate that it becomes okay. That it becomes okay. How about an oven? We'll leave the electric oven for a second. All right, let's look at the, you know the older ovens with the, 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 the fire inside it. Am I allowed to open an on oven on Shabbat? Give me reasons why yes and reasons why no. I'm not talking about putting anything inside. Just the act of opening the door when the flame is exposed. Yes. It might go out. It might go out. Okay. I would say to you, it's okay. Because I'm opening the door. Air goes in. And the... Goes up. Isn't that a psych ratio with grammar? What's the difference between opening the fridge and opening the oven with the fire inside? I mean, it's both the same mechanism, right? In one case, I'm opening the fridge, hot air goes in, triggers the machine, and the other one, I open the door, wind goes in or cold air goes in and either increases or possibly blows up. What's the difference with that one? Yeah? Yeah. So you're saying it's a little bit closer to the light switch than the other one. Right, and it's not much of right away. It's not like it's really so I had this question many years ago when I learned this during Smicha and asked my Rav, and he had the same question. The Gates had rather the same question with years now. And he emailed um, 
Who is Shua Shal Chasa? New worth, was it? And he wrote back and said, actually, there's no real difference. Just one is dealing with a naked flame, a real fire, and that's what they dealt with in the Mishkan. And one is dealing with like electrical stuff, right? Which isn't what they're doing. So we're just a little bit more lenient when it comes to it. But in, 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 in reality, maybe the two are not so different, but we're more stringent when it comes to opening an on oven on Shabbat, if there's a naked flame over there. Okay? But you could see some room for lenience as well, because it's still a grandma, even there as well. Okay, if you know for sure it's gonna go out, then that's a problem. Okay, let's throw, yes, sorry. Um, you said that when you open the fridge and the light turns on, it's still low Nikolai. It's, it's Nikolai, it's good, you get benefit from it. I could find a scenario where opening the fridge and the light, and the light turning on is actually to know the low Nikolai if I get no benefit because the item is in the door. So it is, it's the item is in the door as opposed to inside the fridge. It's still forbidden. But we're going to see, we're going to play around with this a little bit where there's no direct benefit to it. Let's take it in a situation though where you didn't tape up your light in your fridge, right? And you didn't take out, or let's put it this way, your husband didn't take out the food from the car like you asked him to a thousand and one times. Or you left your beautiful Shabbos outfit, you went to the Ufra for the Shabbaton, you left it in the car, right? Candles have been lit, it's Shabbos. Now what you're going to do? So Pesik Reisha, Alide Goy is okay. Pesik Reisha, in most circumstances that I can think of, Alide Goy for a non-Jew is okay. Okay? You can ask him. Doing it Alide Goy, yes. Let's figure out why first of all. Let's figure out why we have that scenario. What was the way Malachot were done in the Mishkan? A Jew did it for themselves, for benefit. So theoretically, I could get a goy to do anything for me. A non -Jew, are non-Jews allowed to cook? Yes. Are they allowed to turn on lights? Yes. The rabbi said, listen, some call Amir la Akum. Once we do that, we're going to lose all of Judaism because you're going to get a joy to do everything for you as well. A goy will drive you around and do this for you, and cook for you, and clean for you. The rabbi said, absolutely not. Totally forbidden. Not okay. That's a direct malacha. But if I found a situation which I've moved away from the malachat machshevet, and I am standing away from it because it's a psik ratio, but it's still a psik ratio. Nachon? It's still not the exact malach that was done. Now, we don't do it because you actually get direct benefit, but it's still like a little secondary thing. In a situation where there is a need, not just to have fun, but there is a real need, like you want to have food for Shabbat, you want better food for Shabbat, right? Not just like stuff I need, but stuff I want, right? I could wear another dress, but I don't want to wear that dress. No problem. Going opens the door. What's the problem opening the door on Shabbat? Is the opening of the door a problem? No. What happens when you open the door? Light, Light turns on. Same thing. Therefore, I call my local uh, non Jew 1 800 Goy, right? The Shabbos Goy, as they're typically known. This is actually what they were for, this kind of stuff. Or we'll see later on changing temperatures in rooms, heat and cold, right? Because that the rabbis will lean into on as well. So people would get sick with the extreme heat or extreme cold. They cannot do malacha for you. They're doing a Pasik Reisha. They want to open the fridge for you to get something out. They can open the fridge for you. They can close the fridge for you, which means the light's coming on, light's going off. They can open the car door for you. They can close the car door for you. It's a Pasik Reisha, but it's Alide Goy. It's okay. Lee. If you're going to cab before Shabbat started, and then you're running late and Shabbat started, and the cab driver is not Jewish, so then when you get there, it's already Shabbat, and you ask them to open the door for you, does that count as this? Yes, yes, you're not expected to spend the rest of Shabbos inside the car. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a serious question, absolutely. But why, absolutely. I mean, I remember in Yom Kippur, I went to a Bet Chabad here, and people told me not to, like, the goy was opening the door and, and pressing the elevator. Aha, so that's and slightly, that is, that is, like, that is slightly different. That is slightly different. That's slightly different. Here, he's doing a malacha, a direct malacha that is benefiting you. That's not over here. Over here, he does the malacha, and you are directly benefiting from it. It's not a secondary thing. When he does that act, boom! You're getting direct benefit from that act. And she also get benefit, because he opens the car for her, the door for her. So I don't, like... 
Because well, I, in that case, well, so in that case, that you're in a case of necessity, so we allow it. Also necessity because the shul is on the second floor. You could walk up. I, I, I think no, you couldn't. I don't know why. Just it was a go. Like, no, no, sorry, the door. The door was electronic, and he opened the door for us. Also the elevator, but like the door also. Opening a door. It was locked because Jews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if he wants to come and swipe the key for you to let you in, do something like that for you, yeah. that's okay. That would be a psych ratio. Pressing elevator buttons for you to get in the elevator and go up is more problematic. I've asked many questions about this. The only thing I've got to which is a little close is that it's his job to do that. So he's getting the personal benefit himself because his job is to do this for you. I have heard people rely upon that. Which is why we don't ask him. I mean, yeah, that's we kind didn't of ask him. It was his job. That's kind of his job to do it. That, that could be better. Again, the people are strict on that. The people are strict on that. The general, let me give you the general rule. The general rule goes like this. They can do a malacha for themselves and you can benefit from it. If they're doing it for themselves, not for you. La mashal. La mashal. Um, you cannot say to them, Make me a cup of tea. They're doing malacha for you on Shabbat. No, but let's if just they say want to make tea for themselves and a little bit less left over for you benefit from it, that's okay. You walk into a room with a turns on the light. Why? Because he wants to see where he's going. Now you're going to go in to that room and you can benefit from the light. If they came in and said, I'm doing this for you, click, you can't enjoy it. You can get a benefit from it. If there's a little bit of existing light, then you can. But if it's a completely dark room, you cannot sit in that room and read Le Machal and use that, that light directly. Also, one second, let me just ask something else. Okay, let's try to figure this out together. Because I have to get my head back into this. Um, you cannot ask a goy to do a malacha for you. But if there was another way they could do the malacha, which is permissible, and they choose the one that's forbidden, then it's also okay. For example, I can say to a goy, could you clean my dishes for me, please? Now we're going to see when we learn, we learn the malacha of schita. You cannot use sponges to clean your plates on Shabbat. Squeezing them out. You cannot use sponges. Okay? No sponger. You cannot turn on the hot water faucet in your home either on Shabbat. Hot water comes out, cold water goes into the thing, it starts cooking, even though it's secondary, that's forbidden. Okay? Turning use hot water in your house on Shabbat is forbidden as well. If the goy wants to clean those dishes using a sponge and hot water, that's up to them. They could have cleaned it without a sponge with cold water. That's possible. If they want to do it that way, that's the way they did it, that's permitted. But doing it directly for you, that you benefit from it personally, is problematic. Yeah? I have a question about the fridge light. So you, you forgot to turn off the fridge light, and you're not allowed to tell straight to um, a shop's boy um, to like, turn it off? Like you, have to you, can, no, no, you can say to the guy, please open my fridge for me. Because the act of opening the fridge, you're not saying turn on the light for me. You can't say turn on the light. You can say it because I'm going to open the fridge. It's going to end up leaving the lights on. So you can do it. I don't think you have to remember our mess. I'll double check. I can don't you, believe so. Can you tell them to take the light for you? If one, one forgot to off. remove the refrigerator light before Shabbos, a non-Jew may be asked to open the door to remove food, even though this will inevitably cause the light to go on. He may also be asked to close the door afterwards, even though this will cause the light to go off. Similarly, if one forgot to take the button that controls the fan, it's not a refrigerator model. The fan goes on automatically. A non has to open the, and close the fridge door when necessary, even though this will cause the fan to go on or off. Asking the non to tape the switch. Who had that question? You're on your way, sister. You're on your way. Asking the non to tape the switch is permitted under the same conditions. That unscrewing the light bulb is permitted as well. On Shabbat. Allowed to ask him to tape it. That's not a problem. Ask the non to tape the switch. It's meant on the same conditions that unscrewing the light bulb is printed. See Marve. When we get to Marve, I guess we're going to do it in more detail. Yeah. If you see people like waiting for the elevator, so they're going to get on anyway, then can you go in the elevator? So elevators have their own set of problems. Let me just ask something over here. Are you getting onto an elevator that's not a Shabbos elevator? You're increasing the weight. Elevators are made in a certain way that they change force according to how many people are inside. So two people, they add a sign. But three people and four people, as false. The Shabbat elevator, what's the difference between a Shabbat elevator and another one? Besides the non-pressing of the buttons, it's made on a constant force. It's 
made into constant force. This is the force it goes, no matter how many people are bored. You adding yourself to the elevator doesn't add any extra malacha to be done by the elevator system itself. That's the difference. Similarly, if you were to add yourself to a car on Shabbat, your extra weight would need extra energy to burn that car, to move the car around. <coughs> that would be problematic. As opposed to, careful when I say this, the careful, the subway, which is not done for other possible reasons of getting in and out, but theoretically, the train is pulling off, pushing off, you're doing nothing, you're not increasing any weight on it, it's almost at the same level as Shabbos elevator. We don't do it for other reasons. Okay, Marit Ayan, Ugdan Dachal, and other things we'll see when we get to that. But the actual act itself is slightly different. So you adding any extra to it, so getting out to an elevator, that's all the difference between the Shabbos elevator and the other <coughs> elevator. It's not just the beam itself, right? Or the, it's actually the amount of weight you're adding to it. So Shabbos elevator, when it goes up, makes a equal force in order to get you up. Yeah. Great question. Ain't so high tech, your example. You're walking through the streets. You're walking through the streets and your neighbor has one of those light things that comes on when you walk past it. Good question. And perfect for our scenario over here. Yay or nay? Yay. Give me the reasons. Yes, you can walk past and reason you can't walk past. What's actually happening? You've got to think back to how malachas were done, what's really happening. Someone hasn't spoken yet. We're playing tennis over here. Who hasn't spoken yet over here? Here, yeah, give me this over here. Um, is there just a great show? Because it's inevitable that it's going to turn on. So you're, so you'll be like totally forbidden to walk past that, knowing yeah. full well it's going to turn on. Someone give me an opposing view. If it's light out. That's a good one. That's a good one. If it's light out, what does the light out add to the equation? I'm not getting too much benefit from that action as well. Good. What else? There's street lights usually anyway, so it's probably secretion the nichalai. The low nichalai. That's what you're saying. So it's street lights out anyway. I'm not getting benefit from it. What else? And I'll tell you what they taught my daughter in school in yeshiva, which, by the way, made absolutely no sense to me. I, I just don't know why. They, 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 they actually. Well, let's see the problem. I'll give you the solution. That's one of the solutions they give, which, by the way, I do not recommend. I don't know why they taught my daughter this, and I. Forbade my daughter from doing this. Okay, so we found right. What else? What's the, what's the you mean the big? What's the big one? What's the big one? Dolo nichale. It's psik ratio because I'm not directly doing it, but it's grandma, right? How did we turn lights on? The finger. When I walk past it, how am I turning it on? With my whole body. My body is walking past it. Is that how you turn lights on? No. Now I don't think you can say shinui. Because that's the way this light turns on. I say, don't know what you call a shinu in an unusual way of doing it, because the way that's this light turns on that way. So I don't know if you can say that, but it's definitely grandma. I stand in the way, they're like another beam come there, and the light turns on. Truth be told, and there are people who hold that it's you can't break Shabbat with your body. Right? It has to be done with a direct action. So truth be told, it's probably not a problem. You've taken out the benefits of the lights out there. What do they teach my kid in yeshiva? Ask somebody in your class. No, no. Oh, yeah, exactly. Anyone got, so you don't need to do that. Um, they told them that if the light turns on, close your eyes for a few seconds. <laughs> Are you serious? I think most of the that says this. I haven't seen it inside personally, but I may have read it somewhere. So uh, for the first few seconds, the light turns on. Right? You're not getting benefit from it. You're not enjoying it. And then you can just walk off. I said, no, do not walk down the street and close your eyes, okay? I just, uh, truth be told, there's probably no problem with it, right? You're not getting direct benefit from it, it's either light usually out, right? Sunlight, right? Or, or at least some other street light. If it's pitch black, let's put it this way. I'll tell you where it wouldn't be, okay? When you need to have some light, it's really dark, you know the light's over there, and you walk into the beam to have the light come on. <clears throat> that you can't do. But if you're walking past, it comes on, by the way, my, my in-laws live on the street where every time, and every time I walk past, I'm like, oh, knock them while it turns on. You know, every time I walk past, it always comes on. Truth be told, it's probably not a problem. I'm not getting benefit from it. If it's really dark and I can, oh, I can really get benefit from it, 
But it's a psik ratio, you throw in a grandma, I think, over here, right? Probably not a problem, to be honest with you. Now, high tech buildings, I mean, we'll get to a point very soon where you're going to walk into a room, everything turns on automatically. You know, you're going to start wearing wearable devices. I'll leave that to the great rabbis who decide these things. I'm not a POSEC, but uh, it's tricky. Oh, I must mention one other thing. I'm so sorry, holding it. I'm so sorry, so sorry. Actually, last time I did this course, I showed this video. I'm not doing it this time. Um, the video of the kosher switch. Oh, yeah. The Shabbos whiteboard is so funny. Right, that's why I was trying to <laughs> People got upset with that, by the way. People got very upset with that, that part of it. So the kosher switch was made by a very, very nice guy, someone I know pretty well. And I can't get into it right now. He actually says that it's not a psych ratio, because then it'd be forbidden. Okay. The way it works, I'll give you just, as far as I can remember, the brief version of it. The brief version. The brief version is, you hit a switch, the light does not come on immediately. Helpful, okay? It comes on at a random time, anywhere between 30 seconds and a few minutes, okay? The way it works is that beams are being shot at, okay? Then the light turns green. There's no beam at that point. I move the switch. The switch is just moving a piece of plastic, like that. That allows the beam to hit, which ends up turning the device. So what he did was very, very interesting. When I spoke to him about it, he came to speak to me about it, and he said that, actually, I, I got him the videographer to make that video as a friend of mine. He said that the idea behind it, which he spoke to Rabbi's about is, I'm not doing anything. I'm moving the switch up. Nothing's happening. It's just moving out the way of a beam that may connect right after I do it, or may take a few minutes. So I'm th it's definitely a, a nikhale. That That's really the problem, because I'm getting better from the light eventually. But it, it's, it's a psych ratio for sure. He says, throw in a grandma. It's far enough away. He said, actually calls it the ungrama, is what he calls it. If you look at the rabbis who speak about it, some people say, oh, malacha doraisa, absolutely. The opinions on this go the full gamut. And some people will be like, on Yom Tov, absolutely okay. On Shabbat, possibly. Some person were like, not good for a home, but in a hospital where lights need to be turned on and stuff needs to be done, better this way than a direct light switch. So pretty much everyone agreed in the hospital is a good thing to do. But for in your home where it's not, I'm not like an emergency. I'm just like, in the hospital lights to be turned on, better, turn on, turn off. Better this way than the other way. And something like Isra Bonan, so I had the full gamut, but it was around this area, I'm not an expert on this, but it was around this area of, uh, of stuff uh, that was discussed about it, yeah. I mean, I just, my grandfather is not mobile, he has a uh, stair lift in his home, but from, on Shabbos when he goes to shul, he has his grandma switch. Yes, now grandma switches are not new. Grandma switches, doctors use them all the time, and people, disabilities like that use them, that's fine. What's the grandma switch? That's exactly this. Yeah. It's adding an extra level over there, it happens on a... That would be a necessity. But just because I want to have dinner, I mean, it's close. We're, we're, but just because I want to do dinner and I'm moving this, which eventually lets the beam and the beam may connect and it tries a bunch of times, eventually it does, and that's going to turn on. I get benefit from it. That's different. In doctor's surgeries and hospitals and stuff like that, they will allow it. What? Yes. What's the grandma? Grandma, right? You turn on, it doesn't immediately happen. It goes through a certain process, there's a random thing, and then it happens. It's pretty much this, actually. I don't personally see the difference and the difference they said for personal use just in the home get a light on you can't do by the way when the time switches were created there was backlash yeah. right there was backlash and now everyone's got a time switch right every house every you know i think Moshe was against it when it first came out Robert Weinstein was against the whole time switch thing you know there's a difference though the difference is i do an act before shabbos that leads to an act happening on shabbos as opposed to me doing something, even though I'm not doing anything, I'm moving a piece of plastic that's gonna allow something else to happen. I said, when he came to me, I said, and I came for years before, he, I said, don't, it's a great idea. It's not gonna be bought by the market. They're, they're gonna, when you mess with Shabbos Halacha, people get very, very strict. I'm just telling you. When it comes to Hilcha Shabbos, people get like crazy from, right? And in make case they should, right? And they're like, we do not mess, right? So that was, um, that, and I told him, it's not going to be accepted. I said to him, and he said, what's the difference? Time switches. They said, the thing about time switches. But time switches, you're doing it before Shabbos. It just is different, which leads to happening on Shabbos, right? 
even here I'm doing something on the light like, come on it's too close it's too close even you can prove it's, it's a grandma over here it's like that what about doing like that and the light that would be a similar thing why For you, because I'm doing, doing something anything. which is I hear but I'm still doing an action which leads to the audio coming on here there as well yeah it's better than it's a main mistake it's better than turning the light switch on that we know for sure it's what? It's better than just turning the light switch on. Oh, I've got to stop in a second. Yeah, last question. What about sliding doors? Like in hotels, let's say they don't have a door, you can just open it. Same thing as so. The problem you're going through, you're making that happen, even though you're using your body, you're getting, there you're getting benefit from it. You that you can't do. What people will now do, they'll have a non-Jew go through first and run through if they have to. But you said you can have extra light if you're your own body. Right. We're still careful not to do it. Here I'm getting a direct benefit from it. Mm -hmm. That will not do. That will be the scenario of, I guess, the sliding door of dark area. I'm going to go directly in the beam and all the light to come on. I'll put that in the same equation. This has been fantastic. We did a lot today. We didn't actually finish it, but we got very, very close. Good job.